Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Professor Chris Alden. I'm one of the directors here at LSE Ideas, a think tank, uh, foreign policy think tank at the LSE. Uh, we're very pleased to uh, have you join us today. Um, we are speaking on a, a, a very appropriate topic, a topic that is, is uh, uh, sort of making the rounds around the world at this stage, which is assessing uh, the, the, the condition of the global economic order, and in particular uh, discussions about, as we are today, a new Bretton Woods system and uh, the international, uh, looking at the, the, the international system that was established after the Second World War from an historical perspective. And I don't think we could have any better group of speakers uh, and, and discussants than the ones we have today. It's what, what you might call the, the proverbial embarrassment of riches. Um, we're, we've asked uh, pr uh, Professor Margaret McMillan, uh, Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford and former warden of St. Anthony's College at Oxford to, to speak first. She's specializing in the history of the British Empire, international history of the 19th and 20th centuries, and is of course here uh, the Engelsberg Chair in, in History and International Affairs here at the LSE um, Ideas. Um, Secondly, we, she will be followed by uh, Professor Nairi Woods, who's the founder, founding dean of the uh, Blatvatnik uh, School of Government and, uh, and a professor of global economic governance at Oxford University. Her research focuses on how to enhance the governance of organizations, the challenges of globalization, global development, and the role of international institutions in global economic governance. She will be followed by Professor Rana Mitter, Director of the University of China Center and Professor of History and, po and Politics of Modern China at St. Cross College, Oxford University. His work is, focuses on the emergence of nationalism in modern China, both in the 20th, early 20th century and up to the present era. Um, finally, he will be followed uh, by uh, also in, in commentary and discussant uh, uh, mode will be Professor Andreas uh, Velasco, who's the Dean of the School of Public Policy at, here at the LSE. Uh, in, from 2017 to 18, he was a member of the G20 Eminent Persons Group. 2015 and 2016, he co-chaired the, the Global Panel on the Future of Multilateral Lending Institution, was a presidential candidate in Chile in 2013, and served as financial minister, Ministry of Finance between March 2006 and March 2010. So as I said, a very eminent group of, of academics with, with policy experience in their background as well. Um, if I can ask uh, Margaret to, to open the, the discussion today. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel with everyone else talking about what is a very important and I think particularly at the moment very timely subject, because I think there is a good deal of pessimism about the international order. Is it collapsing? What will replace it? Are we in for a period of anarchy, um, of um, competition between different states? Um, so it is a moment, I th think, to reflect. I will talk about the historical context and leave it to others to talk about the economic importance of the Breton Woods organization. But I'd like to start by saying that, of course, it is an international system. And what that means is that while you have economic institutions such as the Breton Woods ones, the IMF, for example, and the, and the, and the World Bank, and they are key, of course, to fostering stability, trade development, but those institutions and others devoted to other purposes are embedded and accompanied by a web of fellow institutions. The proliferation of international organizations um, since the Second World War, everything from the International Aviation Authority to the United Nations, as well as separate security arrangements, arm control, arms control regimes, furthermore, development of international law, a huge body of law now developing and norms as well. And added to all that, of course, a growing proliferation of NGOs and, and the increasing importance since 1945 of international public opinion. And so what we're looking at is not just the institutions themselves, but the whole network of ideas and, and fellow institutions and norms within which they're embedded. What I think tends to produce these international orders 
is usually a crisis. Um, the, to, nothing like a good crisis or a bad crisis for making us focus on what it is that we need to do if we are to live together and, and of course, increasingly now save the planet. Walter Scheidel, I think, has been very good on this. The great catastrophes, the pandemics, the economic crashes, the collapses of societies often into revolution, a war, of course, and of course today climate change, these sorts of crises which call into question the whole international order and, and call into question the very survival of the different states and the different communities and societies embedded in that international order force us and have done so at various times in history to think about alternative ways of managing our affairs and trying to bring about some degree of, of stability, if not um, peace and harmony. The idea that we have some sort of international order is, of course, not a new one. Throughout history, we have seen various attempts and various organizing principles which have attempted, if not globally, at least regionally, to bring about some sort of order and stability. And these are very roughly, and I, I won't go into detail, empire, which I would argue is still a mode of organization which is with us today, um, probably the most common form of human government throughout history. And I think although we thought after 1945 the age of imperialism was finished and gone, I think if we look at the Chinese treatment of many of their neighbors, if we look at Russia itself, which is in some ways one of the last great European empires, I think we can argue that empire is still very much with us. There have also been attempts throughout history in different parts of the world to build a community of religious believers to create perhaps a, a paradise on earth. Um, in Christendom, for example, there were many such attempts to build at least a Christian Europe. And after the, after the birth of the prophet, there was an attempt to build an Islamic community of believers. And then of course you have ideologies, um, the Chinese ideology of the mandate of heaven, according to which the emperor of China was placed on the throne to act as an intermediary, and, and Professor Mitter will know much more about this than me, to act as an intermediary between heaven and earth. And it was believed that the emperor was at the summit of humanity. Um, this, I think, was a very important, at least in, in, in terms of, of East Asia. More recently, 19th century liberalism, which believed in a spread of constitutions, free trade, liberal values, which would somehow knit the world together. And the great challenge to 19th century liberalism, Bolshevism, which attempted to build a worldwide communist society in which all natural borders would dissolve. But until the 19th century, these attempts to build international orders were regional, simply because the regions of the world were so distant from each other in, in space and time that it wasn't possible to conceive of a worldwide order which would cover the whole of the globe. And of course, the crucial changes of the 19th century began to make it possible to imagine a truly global order which covered the whole globe. Um, I don't need to go through all of them, but just briefly industrialization, which increased not just the productive capacity of societies, but produced a huge revolution in communications, the movement of trade, peoples and investment around the world, the movement crucially of ideas around the world. And what also happened in the 19th century was the emergence and recognition of truly global challenges and problems. The first attempts globally to deal with pandemics were in the 19th century, attempts made to deal with such things as cholera, a plague of which there were great outbreaks right up until the end of the 19th century. And that century, the 19th century, saw the first truly global health organizations, among other things. What was also happening in the 19th century, and of course it's still with us very much today, was the growing deadliness of war. One of the unforeseen consequences of the Industrial Revolution and the accompanying scientific and technological revolution was a vast increase in our capacity to destroy, to destroy buildings, to destroy landscapes, and of course, crucially, to kill people. And if you look at the progress of war in the 19th century, war becomes increasingly deadly. The weapons are that much more effective. Um, the damage that it, war can inflict is, is that much greater. And what also becomes possible in the 19th century are longer wars thanks partly to the productive capacity of the societies fighting them in Europe, for example, but thanks also to the communications which make it possible to put armies into the field and to keep them there. And the culmination, of course, of this, or so people thought at the time, was the First World War, which was meant to be over by Christmas of 1914 and lasted until nearly Christmas of 1918. And so the 19th century 
context and changes obliged and stimulated thinking about how can we build a different international order. And what began to happen in the 19th century, again, and many things that are still with us today, um, development of ideas about how we might manage these global challenges and manage these increasingly deadly wars or increasingly deadly pandemics. And so the 19th century saw the, the development of international law. It saw such things as the Geneva and Hague Conventions, which attempted to moderate the impacts of war on those fighting it and on civilians, but also attempted to make war less possible, attempted particularly the Hague um, Conventions and the big Hague Conferences at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries attempted to bring about universally agreed disarmament. There was also tremendous hope, I think, placed on the possibilities of arbitration that states would agree to submit their differences to each other and settle them in a nonviolent way. And in 1899, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which still exists today, was set up in The Hague. That initially rather hopeful period, of course, culminated and in the disillusionment of the First World War. And I think it's hard to overestimate the shock of that war. It was something that um, some people had expected, but few had expected it to be as bad as it was. And I think many Europeans, rather like I think most of us um, before the war in Ukraine started, thought that we had moved beyond war. Europeans thought in 1914 war was not something they any longer did. And they found that they did. And as they looked, and as people around the world looked at what was left of Europe and, and indeed other parts of the world, by the time the guns fell silent in 1918, they were shocked and horrified at what they'd done. And I think pessimistic about the possibilities of something even worse happening in the future. I mean, there was a very real sense that if the powers of the world did not get together post-1918, the world would be headed for an even greater catastrophe. And of course, added to that was the challenge of Bolshevism, the successful revolution in Russia in 1917, which seemed to be stimulating further revolutions, which might well become an irresistible tide. That was certainly, of course, what the revolutionaries themselves thought. And so part of the response, both to the thinking of the 19th century and drawing very much on that thinking, but also to the catastrophe and the destruction, nine million dead, mainly soldiers, and then of course, followed by the influenza pandemic, which may have killed as many as 50 million people, plus the very visible physical destruction, the disappearance of empires, all of this brought about a real impetus for fresh thinking about the international order, which can be summed up, I suppose, briefly as Wilsonianism, the ideas of President Wilson, but those drew very much on, on much earlier ideas from the 19th century and, and even earlier still. Its key features were the belief that there could be a spread of shared values, the spread of, of democracy, the spread of constitutional government, um, a faith in the self-determination of peoples, a faith that free trade would help to knit the economies and therefore the peoples of the world more closely together, a hope that there would be widespread disarmament, and of course the crucial organization of the League of Nations, the idea that you would have a League of Nations that would provide collective security for each other and form a common front against aggressors. Well, as we know from history, um, a lot of those hopes of the post-World War period were dashed in the 1930s. And I think two very important lessons were learnt by those who made policy in the aftermath, during and in the aftermath of the Second World War. One was the domestic implications of the Great Depression, that it led in many countries to a, a heightening of, of, of conflict between the various poles. It led to an appeal of populist parties, whether on the left or the right, which were frequently, as in the case of the Nazis, for example, or the communist parties, anti-democratic and offered new ways of doing things, offered new hope and, and a tremendous growth in those parties, very largely as a result of, of, of the Great Depression. And so one of the lessons that was drawn by people like President Roosevelt of the United States was that economic depression can lead to the polarization of societies can in some cases lead to revolution, can some, in some cases lead to the assumption of by power of illiberal forces. And that was very much in their minds as they thought about what sort of economic order they wanted after, this, after the Second World War. And the other thing, of course, was the impact of, of, of the Great Depression internationally, which led to a raising of tariff barriers, a lack of trust among nations, a sense particularly on the ha among the have-not nations, that if they didn't look out for themselves, they would not be looked out for by any of the more powerful nations. And so the lessons that were learned, I think, 
from the failure of an attempt to build an international order after 1919, particularly the crisis of the 1930s, were that if the world is to avoid a third world war, and this of course was, was, was very much something in the minds of those making decisions, that they should try and build an order which was inclusive, which brought together those of, of different political views, which attempted to spread shared liberal values around the world, which also attempted to develop the economies of countries, the poorer countries, but also the richer countries in ways that gave economic security to their citizens. And I think very much behind the thinking that produced both Bretton Woods, but also produced the United Nations was this idea that unless nations can cooperate together for the good of their citizens, they will continue to suffer domestic upheavals. Unless they can cooperate, they will continue to have wars. And so what came out of the Second World War was a renewed attempt, and in some ways a much more successful attempt, because what really made a difference in this case was that the United States was fully behind a new world order um, in ways that it had not been fully behind the, the Wilsonian order. Roosevelt was very insistent that he bring the Republicans along with him, along with his Democratic Party, and I think very successfully so, because the United States not only joined the Bretton Woods organizations, became a mainstay of those, but also joined the United Nations. The trouble is, and, and others will talk more about this, is that often as time goes by, we forget why we needed such institutions. And I think by the 1970s, memories of the 1930s no longer as vivid. Those who had them were, were, were disappearing from the scene. Memories of why it was important to set up these organizations post-1945 were beginning to fade. And the real undermining, I think, of Bretton Woods and, and indeed the United Nations, I think, came in the 1970s and later because I think there was a lack of understanding, a lack of a visceral reaction that we really needed something like this. And I think we're something in this position again today that we have, we got used to the post Cold, Cold War era. We, we assumed that it would all go well. We forgot the dangers of the Cold War. We forgot how it nearly embroiled on several occasions that the war, the world in, in outright conflict. And I think we're facing renewed challenges today, much as people faced after 1918, much as they faced them after 1945. And we're facing perhaps certainly even, I won't say perhaps, I'll say so, even greater challenges than they faced then, because we are really now truly facing global challenges, both in the nature of the wars that might be fought with enormous destructive capacity and also in, in, in climate change. And so I think it is a good moment to reflect and we have a lot to reflect on. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can I ask uh, Nairi to pick up from that? Well, yes, and thanks um, from me as well, Margaret, for such a rich um, historical view of where these institutions sit. Um, so I think I'd like to start today with why, why do we care today about what the Bretton Woods Institutions stand for? And it's an obvious thing to say that the world is in desperate need of some cooperation, that Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine has very quickly divided a world into a Europe and United States that have a certain, a certain moral certainty. They know that there are good guys and bad guys. The good guys are with them. The bad guys are either abstaining or, uh, or vetoing uh, their positions on Ukraine. But what of course has happened is we've seen the rise of what I would call a coalition of the rest who are not comfortable with either side. The 40 countries who abstained or voted against the, U the US position in the first UN vote, which then even after further Russian atrocities in Ukraine, bloomed into 82 countries in the second UN vote. And I want to start with that problem to say the problem of how we get cooperation in a world which is fracturing even as we speak, and in which the great powers are trying to make it you're either completely with us or you're completely against us, is giving rise to a third kind of new non-aligned movement um, sitting in contrast to the other great powers. We need cooperation. So let me move straight to why we so need international cooperation urgently now. Three reasons, famine, energy, debt. The world faces famine, even as stockpiles in some countries are at all-time highs. 
the world faces a fuel crisis, not because there isn't enough fuel in the world, but because of its distribution. And the world faces a debt crisis across developing and emerging countries. A debt crisis we've seen so many times before because the lenders want to grab their money and run. And the only way to solve such a crisis is through cooperation. So those are three reasons for cooperation today, not tomorrow, but starting today. Because in every one of those three, if we can bring all countries of the world into one forum to agree an absolute minimum of rules, we can actually resolve all three of these problems. And that's why we need international institutions. That's why the Bretton Woods institutions were built. So they were built to do at least three things. The first is to be a forum of discussion, not fighting. You can fight or you can talk. The institutions are the place for talking to take place. Second, to build rules, that rules that governments, sovereign states readily agree to. And third, to monitor those rules and to give some assurance, because a rule is worth much more than just a constraint on yourself. What a rule helps you do is to decide what other people will do. How likely is it that they will invade you, repay their debts to you, keep their trade borders open to you? Your assurance that they might do all those things, that they might keep their borders open, that they might repay their debts, is very much the product of them belonging to an institution that's created those rules and monitored the, the compliance with them. So what's the history and what does the history of these institutions tell us? I think the history of certainly of the IMF and World Bank, as I record its history, is that there are these three parameters that define what they do, that the people that work inside them often believe they're technocratic organizations, but in fact, they're governed first by a big geopolitical parameter. During the Cold War, they lined up very closely behind the West as it was then. After the end of the, um, after the, end of the Cold War, they engaged instantly in the so-called systemic transformation of what became Russia, um, some of the legacy of which we're dealing with today. With the great shift in global politics, China's become the third largest uh, shareholder in those two institutions. And geopolitically, that matters because the people at the, the countries at the top of these institutions really do set a parameter within which they work. The second shaping feature of them are the technocrats within them or the bureaucratic features of them, who they hire and how those for example, economists in the 1980s, how they thought about problems, how they defined those problems, what they thought were solutions to them. So in the 1980s, as countries went into a debt crisis, a different organization might have said, look at what we did in the 19th century, the period Margaret talked about. When a country had a debt crisis, the bondholders were told to go try their luck at negotiating with the government. And the result was, you shared the losses. You shared the losses between creditors and debtors. In the 1980s, the fund and bank didn't do that. They had financial stability to look after. They ended up inadvertently playing bailiff to the world's banks that nobody could afford to let crash. And that was because it wasn't just ideological with a big eye. It was ideological with a small eye. It's because that's the way that these staff were trained to analyze problems and provide their solutions. So the geopolitical matters, but so too do the technocrats within these organizations, who they hire, how they're organized, and who leads the organization. And of course, Europe and the United States are still leading both and deciding the leadership of both the IMF and the World Bank. And because of the way the world is dividing, that's increasingly problematic because the coalition of the rest, the new non-aligned movement are asking, what's our stake in those organizations? How assured can we be that they've got our back? So the leadership and organization of them matters. The third thing that shapes what they do, of course, are the borrowers themselves and what those borrowers demand and what those borrowers choices are. If the IMF and the World Bank are the only source of finance in town, the IMF and the World Bank have a huge power, they did in the 1980s. But today, those borrowers have a lot of, they have a lot of different offers. If we just look at the continent of Africa, Russia is now the largest provider of armaments to the continent, providing some 
50% of armaments and security. China is the largest provider of aid and finance to the continent of Africa. So when the US and Europe ask, why aren't they voting with us in the UN? They also need to ask, how are we taking forward our partnership with these countries? Just last week, I spoke with the head of the Congressional Foreign Affairs Committee, who had asked after the second UN vote, each ambassador from the countries that voted against the United States or abstained from the vote, why? And on his account, every one of them said the same thing. They said, oh, now you're coming to talk to us? Why weren't you consulting us before? And again, I say that to underscore that the international institutions created at Bretton Woods are a place where those consultations can and do take place. They are very precious institutions because of that. They are a forum in which every country in the world can take a seat and actually debate and discuss, sometimes outside of the high politics of, of security and conflict. And that's why they're precious. But they won't be precious unless they continue to update, unless they continue to upgrade. And I guess for me, there, there are just a couple of thoughts I want to finish with, and I'm coming very quickly to the end of, of my comments here, which is how do we need to reform them so that they can help us deal with this triple crisis of famine, of fuel, and of debt, as well as the bigger crises of climate and, and global development and financial uh, stability. So I think the first thing is not to make the mistake of making the institutions the pawns of the coalition of the willing. They must stay international institutions. They must be the forum for speaking, not fighting. Um, so it's really important that we give voice to the countries um, who are part of the coalition of the non-aligned, as well as the, the parties that are so sure of their leadership um, in, 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 in global governance. The world just isn't rule makers and rule takers anymore. The rule takers are saying they want a say on the rules or they won't uh, join the coalition. A second is to think about the mandate of these institutions. The mandate after the end of the Cold War became incredibly expansive. It went well beyond um, a narrow form of economic stability, keeping global plumbing going so that you could have financial stability and development funding. It became right to the out, outer edges of good governance and a vision of globalization, which was pushed by the major members of these organizations. That has to actually now be cut right back to the core priorities and minimum on which a couple of hundred countries in the world desperately need cooperation, such as, as I said, famine energy debt. A third, is we need to think about assurance. What gives countries assurance? The country that needed the most assurance in 1947, as Margaret pointed out, was the United States. A country that had promised, whose president had promised no entangling alliances after the war. And how did other countries give the United States assurance? They gave it the headquarters of both Bretton Woods institutions. They gave it a say on the leadership of both institutions. They gave it special voting power so it could veto any major decision. So just those three things tell us about what gives countries assurance. And as we see the rise of the rest, we're gonna to have to think about how to use those things to give those countries assurance as well. Penultimate, the organizations need to be pushed to be counter cyclical. Now that interest rates are going up, now that money is flooding out of emerging countries and developing countries, it's these countries that desperately need both short-term liquidity and a long, longer-term financial horizon to continue to invest in their own development. And frankly, the IMF and World Bank have a pretty bad record of being pro-cyclical instead of counter-cyclical. When global markets shrink, their lending shrinks. When global markets expand, their lending expands. And we need those institutions now to do exactly the opposite, to sweat their balance sheets, to make use of their special ability to raise funding and to make loans against the, the, the economic cycle. And finally, 
We need the institutions to counter fashion, to counter particularly fashions among donors. The world is full of what others call donor darlings, the countries that every single institution and country wants to give money to for all kinds of geopolitical development and public uh, popular reaction reasons. And then there were the donor orphans that countries are not currently funding, but are some of the most desperately needy countries in the world, and sometimes countries that use the funding extremely well. In my view, that's exactly what the IMF and World Bank have the global membership, the balance sheet, the ideas, the research and the heft to do. And thank you, Chris. And first, let me um, offer my thanks both to Margaret and to Nara for extremely uh, thoughtful accounts of Bretton Woods, the history of the institutions and what they mean today. And I think I found myself actually taking from both of your talks uh, some common elements, which um, I think are really very important for this audience and all those who are drawing on this particular set of seminars to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to pay attention to. From Margaret's, I think the word structure of the many words that were put out there, we had ideology, we had revolution, we had industrialization, all of them very key in many ways, but in the end, bringing these all together in some form of structure and the need for order, I think was something that came very clearly from the, the historical uh, trajectory across the century and beyond that, that, that you gave us. And I think that was a tremendously important. In a different sort of way, I think Naira was actually pushing that point too with your three-point list of horrific horsemen of the apocalypse, of, or horse people of the apocalypse, one should say, not to uh, uh, make a, uh, uh, to, to exclude any horse women who may also be coming to bring us uh, doom, uh, famine, energy, and debt. Um, it's very clear again that having institutions which can in various ways encompass and overcome these particular dangers is also dependent as much as anything else on the question of what structures we have, how flexible they are and how they can be can be filled. And structure also, I think, is a useful place for me to give a few minutes worth of thoughts in response. And the way that I want to do that is uh, to draw on the area which uh, occupies my day-to-day -day thinking, which is the question of modern China and its history and the relevance of that history to the, the present day. And actually almost sort of re, kind of rerun both Margaret and Naira's brilliant trajectories, uh, but do them as it were through the eyes of at least some in Beijing over that period. And in fact, those who know their history will know that we wouldn't start in Beijing, we would start in Nanjing, because of course that was the capital of China between 1928 and 1949, when the communists take over. And therefore at the time of the Bretton Woods Conference, it was in fact a Chinese pre-communist nationalist government uh, under Chiang Kai-shek uh, that was actually sending delegates to uh, Bretton Woods. And as Eric, as Eric Halina's fantastic book with a self-explanatory title, Forgotten Foundations of Bretton Woods, one of the most interesting historically informed books of IR written in, in recent years, I think, it is very much the case that the voice of what we would now call, not then, but now called the Global South, yes, China, but also actually many countries from South America and other parts of a world which still was very much uh, enthralled to uh, the power of, Im of imperialism, um, all of those had voices that were heard at the time, but have somehow been forgotten in the world that emerged since then. And when we speak of the Bretton Woods institutions, as well as speaking in a very literal sense of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which of course sit at the heart of that, the wider sense of also the world that Bretton Woods made and the continuation as well as the invention of institutions, including of course what became the GATT and the WTO beyond that, need to I think be put into the equation as well as we consider how that looked through Chinese eyes. So let me use a different word, a different word from structure uh, in terms of explaining what I think the key characteristic that in a strange way unites the Chinese view of these questions about the Bretton Woods institutions and their inheritance all the way from 1947 up to 2022 and beyond. And that word, I think, I could pick a lot of words, but the one I'm going to, to pick is defense. Because I think that a very large part of what has motivated the very, very different regimes that have run China since that time I'm not just talking here about the differentiation between the pre-communist and communist era, but bringing up what I think, you know, people in this 
webinar will know, but it's always worth pointing out, which is that the Chinese Communist Party may have ruled China since 1949, but the way in which it has done so is a breathtakingly varied series of regimes with a very different system of governance and a very different set of economic precepts under lying them I think you said undermining them there which was perhaps a Freudian slip but perhaps both of those could be uh, could be true let's start with that presence of um uh, the nationalist government of China at Bretton Woods and it's worth noting that even in those early days of international negotiation there was a limited but real presence actually of the then um uh, um relatively um, well, the, the presence of the of the Chinese Communist Party, which was not then in power, but still had some interest in interaction in cooperative bodies, including, for instance, its participation at the founding conference of the United Nations in April 1945 in, in, in San Francisco. During that period, defense in the wider sense of the word, I think, was a very large part of what motivated the Chinese government of 1947. Bear in mind, this was the government that had led China through the Second World War, a war which for China lasted longer than for any other actor um, other than Japan, which it was fighting during that period from 1937 to 1945, two and a half years before the European war began, four and a half years before the Americans entered the, uh, entered the war. And during that period, the basis on which the fragile League of Nations based series of institutions that marked the interwar period in which China had been an active and enthusiastic participant had proved themselves to be essentially from China's point of view utterly hollow and that was a point of view shared by both Chinese nationalists and Chinese communists across that political divide. The placement of China at the top table of international uh, politics in terms of being a new P5 member of the, uh, the new UN Security Council, uh, in a position sponsored by President Roosevelt before his death and carried on somewhat grudgingly in the, in the Truman administration, was a token that China was going to play a wider role in the new global order. But the gesture was not necessarily matched either by resources or by cooperation at that time, and therefore a very strong sense exacerbated by a new free trade agreement between uh, nationalist China and the United States in the post-war in 1947, which actually helped to fuel infl inflation, created a stronger sense in the minds of many Chinese thinkers that actually the outside world, and particularly the American-oriented um, world, was never going to give China a fair economic shake. And bearing in mind, this is still even for the communists have taken power. Once they had taken power in 1949, China, or at least the mainland of China, had was, was pulled very quickly and very violently, I think that is the right adverb to use, into a different sort of economic model altogether. And that model, of course, was largely shaped, shaped by its entry into the socialist world that was being created under the aegis of Stalin and his successors. But it's worth remembering that that entry into the socialist world, was uh, world economy, was first because of the desire, of course, of Mao to, in his words, lean to one side, in other words, to make it clear that the new socialist China would be oriented towards the left and towards the east rather than the west, but nonetheless was further enforced in that direction by the fact that the United States, uh, not least in the aftermath of the Korean War, but also because of the ideological preoccupations of figures such as John Foster Dulles, was not permitted essentially to participate in a variety of aspects of the international economy, which even members of the Soviet bloc slowly but surely found themselves involved in in the 50s and 60s. There were ways around this. Um, there's brilliant work by um, Amy King, who uh, worked at Oxford and now teaches at the Australian National University, uh, who is in fact working on the uh, aspects of the Bretton Woods institutions and their Asian connections, who has written a wonderful book on the way in which Japan became an unofficially recognized, but in fact, very important economic actor interacting with China through the 1950s, but not really doing so with US blessing at that, uh, that time. Things became yet more troubled after the 1960s, in the 1960s, when the Sino-Soviet split meant that China also found itself isolated from the socialist bloc that it had been part of, and then of course plunged into the madness of the Cultural Revolution, a, um, a project which had very little to recommend it, but ec economic rationality was certainly not part of that mixture either. A form of essentially autarky, but an autarky that was not underpinned by any sort of 
uh, engaged discussion of what an economy essentially isolated from large parts of the outside world was actually supposed to be like. And that's one of the reasons why I think uh, researchers who have done the most recent uh, work on China and the Cultural Revolution have started to point out that the evidence shows that in fact, the move back towards engagement with the wider world and particularly the liberal um, world began much earlier than people have realized. The kind of conventional data has become 1978, Deng Xiaoping starting his reforms. It's now clear that those reforms started much, much earlier and under earlier actors including Zhou Enlai, and while Deng Xiaoping certainly authorized the continuation and expansion of those policies, it was very clear that China's international trade began to become much more uh, a much more important in economic thinking, certainly from the uh, early 1970s onwards, even while the Cultural Revolution continued to, to rage. I bring that historical um, uh, element in at this point, A, because I think it's good to be reminded of how isolated China was, partly through its own choices and partly through choices made by the liberal world, even in comparison to the Soviet Union, the other major you know, non-capitalist actor of the, uh, of the time. And also because all of the things I've talked about still exist within the living memory of one lifetime. You don't, you have to be old, but not ridiculously old to have been around for the beginning of that Bretton Woods period and then through all of the socialist story that I have told. And of course, <coughs> all of those who are now in leadership positions at the top in China are the children, the teenagers of the Cultural Revolution era, who also were trained very strongly in the Marxist econ economics at the time. And I think it is no accident that, to flash forward for a moment, Xi Jinping and those around him expressed their own um, domestic uh, framework for what they're doing as, and I quote, 21st century Marxism. Again, we can come back to, you know, perhaps in the discussion, what that means and how meaningful it is, but I wanted to put it on the table as a way in which today's China understands its own position and a way in which today's China also nods to a longer intellectual tradition, which has existed certainly since 1949. A couple of quick uh, follow-ups that take us take us on. The story after that is, I think, one that's better known, including the return of China to uh, a uh, more integrated place in the international political economy, particularly at a time when uh, US-Soviet tensions in the 70s and 80s 80s in particular, became much more notable. It was a time when uh, the uh, Americans and, and Soviets were boycotting each other's Olympic Games, while China, of course, was uh, performing at uh, both of them. But it also was the era when actually Deng Xiaoping undertook a whole variety of reforms which had a very um, odd sort of global trajectory from the Chicago School uh, via um, South America and Chile through a variety of places, including, of course, Australia and New Zealand under the Longy and Hawke um, governments. Uh, so the governments of the left as well as governments of the right could be part of this. And I don't know whether you'd regard Deng Xiaoping's government as being of the right or left. Perhaps it's one of those things where the, the question of the cat could be good or uh, could be good as long as it catches mice, regardless of its color. But certainly in terms of market economics and experimentation, Deng Xiaoping's China counts as a lesson which not only I was about to say Milton Friedman would be proud of, but as we know, of course, he visited with Rose more than once, but certainly in 1984, uh, no, not more than once, I think it was the once, but once on an extensive tour in, in, in 84 to actually make sure that his views were heard in China at that, um, at that time. And that background, I think, shapes the way in which China was then reintegrated with, I think, the, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, agreement and uh, collaboration of large numbers of people on the US side, very much associated with the Bretton Woods institutions. I think in this company, it would not be, and I, if he's here, I, I, you know, I would say it uh, uh, something I think he'd be very proud of, Bob Zellick, as president of the World Bank, I think regarded as one of his great, still regards it as one of his great achievements that essentially both as an officer of the Bush administration, Bush II, and also as president of the World Bank, that he had essentially integrated China or helped integrate China into those international economic structures. Let me end that, um, the, these sets of thoughts, by taking us into where I think we are now, and that is the world that comes post-2008 and post-global financial crisis. And again, lots of the issues that Naira mentioned at the beginning, including debt in particular, but energy also, I think are ones that um, the Chinese themselves, for obvious reasons, are immensely concerned with today, both in terms of their own debt, but also in terms of the export of debt through the Belt, Belt and Road Initiative, a kind of alternative mechanism of lending, which has proved controversial for a variety of reasons that, again, we can touch on in the discussion if we choose to, to do so. In this case, I would say once again, 
that the question of defense comes up over and over, it comes up once again, just as it was a form of socialist defense against what was seen as a rapacious capitalist world in the 1950s, 60s and 70s for China to take a different path. And even during the time of uh, a more neoliberal turn, it was nonetheless very much the case that China was doing it to preserve the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, not as many hopeful observers from the outside at the time seemed to think because it was about to turn itself into a liberal democracy, which I can say I don't think was ever on the cards. But today, also, the triumphalism, and it is real, that you see in terms of China praising its own economic model, certainly before the recent COVID-related economic downturn, is, I think, still very, very much shaped by the sense that, in the end, the economic model that China undertakes, including its engagement with global economics, must be defensive. And the fact that the old Mao era phrase, Zuli Gongsheng, self-reliance, has come back today at a time of perhaps China's greater integration to the global economy and its involvement in the Bretton Woods institutions specifically, than at any time in its recent history, is a sign that however important it is and necessary for us to engage with the globalizing of China, it is important for us to understand that from the Chinese point of view, at least the leadership point of view, the question of defense of what China has and of preserving structure and stability, to borrow one of Margaret's terms there, structure, I think will always be at the forefront of their minds because the history that they look over from the last 75 years is not the history of much of the global North, which is about a slow but steady accumulation of social democracy and international structures in the aftermath of a ruinous war that ended in 1945, but a series of increasingly perilous adventures in which there are occasional gaps of stability but when you never know when one chaos is about to return yet again. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Chris. Let me hand back to you. Thank you. On the note of chaos, <laughs> uh, um, can I ask uh, Andreas to, to speak? Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be in the world. Thank you, Chris, uh, for this invitation. Of course, thank you, Margaret, Nairi, and Rana for erudite, thoughtful, uh, and very and very provocative sets of remarks. Um, I want to begin, perhaps, to uh, introduce a note of dissent into our deliberations by expressing some skepticism about the general proposition that what the world needs most is international cooperation. Of course we do. The question is, of all the challenges and problems facing the world today, how many of those are to be corrected by international action and how many of those are to be corrected by domestic action? I will list in a few minutes those that require international collaboration, so I am not a complete and total skeptic, but uh, I would point out that, um, you know, once upon a time, it was fashionable to quote the Clinton advisor who said, it's the economy, stupid. I am fond of turning that proposition around nowadays and saying it's the politics, stupid. And politics, as a former speaker of the US House of Representatives once said, politics is always local. If you think about populism, if you think about misgovernance, if you think about demagoguery, if you think about the uh, weakening of democratic institutions in many countries of the world, that is primarily, or those are primarily domestic phenomena. And I say this not to uh, suggest that we don't need international institutions. I say it because I detect, you know, I was at Davos last week, so was Nairi. You go to a place like Davos and of course, everything has to be solved by international cooperation. And the best way of ensuring that the world is disappointed with our international institutions is to task them with the resolution of everything. If you ask them to solve everything, they will be perceived to have solved nothing. And as a result, skepticism, cynicism, and frustration will follow. I think it is a bit more fruitful to try to agree on a definition of what it is that international institutions ought to be doing, what are their crucial tasks, and maybe ask the question, how have the Bretton Woods institutions performed those tasks? 
Margaret was absolutely right in the beginning. There are many international organizations dealing with many, many subjects. But given that Chris's invitation is to talk about the Bretton Woods Institution, let me talk about those. And of course, those are primarily economic institutions. So I will put on my hat as an economist for a minute or two. When, uh, when Keynes and Harry Dexter White and a number of others met in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire after World War II, there were four big tasks. Some have become bigger since, but there were four issues that they had in mind. The first one had to do with international coordination of macro policies, with the avoidance of beggar than thy neighbor policies, that is to say, devaluing my currency to make myself more competitive at the other guy's expense, and the provision of a lender of last resort. If you are bankrupt, you have no more dollars or more, no more pounds, can somebody provide those pounds? Call that macro coordination lender of last resort. Number two, and this was of course the World Bank's remit, was mobilizing private capital for development. Private capital goes to places where it is evidently profitable to go, and in countries with weak institutions, with volatile returns, and with a lot of uncertainty about what the return of that capital will be, uh, private money does not go naturally. It has to be escorted. It has to be led there. And by means of guarantees, by means of its own lending, etc., the World Bank was supposed to help in that. Job number three was to deal with global public goods things that uh, matter to all of us, but nobody wants to pay for them. And um, as a result, we have to come together to pay for them. Uh, dealing with climate change is, of course, the biggest one today. It wasn't so obvious uh, a couple generations ago. Dealing with pandemics is another obvious one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Global public goods were important back then. They're even more important today. Last but not least, there were you know, concern about the spread of knowledge. Presumably there are better ways of doing things. Countries can learn from one another. And uh, it was thought to be effective to have a repository of such knowledge in a place like the World Bank where country X, country Y, or country Z can go and, and say, well, how do you do this? How do you promote competition? How do you discourage um, uh, the uh, contamination of the environment, how do you promote macro stability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess the big question, uh, the big elephant in the room is how well have the Bretton Woods institutions fared in promoting those four objectives and achieving those four goals in the year since? And my take is that, you know, inevitably the answer is, well, reasonably well, okay, but, and this is the main point I want to make, the world has changed in the year since in directions such that the Bretton Woods twins are having more and more trouble every day meeting those four objectives. So if they met them to some extent, if they did fine, not great, but fine 15, 20, 30 years ago, I would like to claim that they're not doing a particularly good job today. And that's not because the Bretton Woods twins changed, that's because the world changed. I had four subjects or four problems that were supposed to be addressing. Let me suggest four things that changed in the world that, um, and that change has made their job a great deal more challenging. The first one, of course, is that um, capital flows grew massively and therefore the firepower that an institution like the IMF needs to be able to stabilize the finances of Argentina or Ukraine or South Africa or Turkey. Those amounts of money used to be small. Today, they are gigantic. So the World Bank, the IMF, the regional development banks are way too small given the size of the world finance and the size of capital flows across countries. Secondly, the structure of the world economy and world patterns of production and trade changed. When the IMF and the World Bank came into being, uh, the world economy was mostly North Atlantic. That's where the action was. That's where the money was. 
Today, the world's economy is mostly around the Pacific, whether in California or in Japan or in China. And as a result, we have an institution built for one world which has to operate in a very different world. And this contrast is most evident in the governance of these institutions, a subject uh, about which Nairi has written quite a bit in the past. Um, you know, the countries that really today have the money and the heft are not represented in the governance of the IMF or the World Bank as they should. This creates governance problems predictably. This also creates a bit of skepticism and even cynicism about the role of these countries. Uh, and thirdly, of course, the um, extent to which global public goods are uh, big, massive threats to human survival have changed. Um, global warming is big, pandemics are big, and uh, the institutions charged with dealing with them are small. And again, we have a mismatch. Last but not least, because the challenges have multiplied and the problems are many, and the countries are not 50 or 60, uh, as they were in the late 40s, but they're 190 some, um, you have institutions that are spread too thin, are often understaffed, are trying to deal with many problems at once. And when you do to try to do many things at once, you typically end up doing none. So in summary, I think that there's a massive mismatch between the size, the firepower, the financial and uh, political weight of the institutions and the jobs that they are called upon to do. And as a result, they don't work very well they don't matter very much and to a subset of emerging and developing countries they're becoming increasingly irrelevant um forgive me for uh, 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 alluding to my own experience uh in, in in making the point i was as a young man in the early 90s the chief of staff of the finance minister of chile i think i went to washington once a month uh 20 years after that i became chile's finance minister i think i went to washington maybe once a year I went to many other capitals in the world a lot more. And, you know, as a rule, I tried to avoid most meetings with the World Bank because they were a complete waste of time. For middle income countries, uh, particularly the World Bank, have become less and less relevant. And as a result, I think we need to be thinking about what it is that the bank should be focusing on, uh, where its comparative and absolute advantage lies. Many people have said they ought to be focusing on global public goods, they ought to be focusing on the climate uh, dilemmas, they ought to be you know, focusing on pandemics and public health. Maybe that is not entirely misguided. Let me end with a couple of thoughts uh, about the current situation. Uh, Nairi in particular alluded to the travails of the West, the coalition of the willing, the coalition of the rest, etc., etc., etc. I would describe the current predicament of the West and the rest in slightly different terms from those which uh, Nairi used. I don't think that there's anything like the non-aligned movement appearing in the world today for a couple of reasons. First of all, because the non-aligned movement was the biggest waste of time in recent human history, and most countries that participated know it. Um, you know, in most Latin American governments, you know, there's a big struggle within the cabinet and trying to agree who will go to the meeting. And typically a very junior member of the cabinet goes because everybody agrees it's a complete and total waste of time. Uh, and as a result, I don't anticipate that this notion will be revived anytime soon. What is clearly happening, of course, is that many mid-sized powers are thinking, well, I have a set of interests which, you know, require me to get along with China not necessarily with Russia, unless you happen to be in that part of the world. Um, China is a big buyer of my products. Many other countries are growing markets. Uh, you know, the US and the EU are not the one place where I want to sell my goodies. And as a result, naturally, countries are pursuing their interests. But their interests are very varied. Their coalitions or the coalitions to which they would like to belong are also many varied. So this notion that we will have the willing and then we will have the rest and the rest will all come together and then we will have China and, and, and Russia as you know, a couple of powers out there. I know Nairi didn't quite say this, but this is sort of in the air. It was talked about at Davos last week. Um, 
I don't quite uh, see things evolving in that direction. So let me ask, you know, if, if, if the world is getting more complicated and if there is a coalition of the willing and if the coalition of the willing mostly today includes Western countries, what should they do? Let me say a thing or two about that and I will end, Chris. Uh, the first thing that the West should do is stop talking about the West. If there's something completely and totally counterproductive, uh, and we saw it at work last week in, in, in Switzerland, is to tell countries which happen to be in the East, whether they be Pakistan or India uh, or South Korea uh, uh, or Indonesia, or that happen to be in Africa, like Nigeria or South Africa, or happen to be in South America, like, 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 like Brazil, please join the Western coalition. Um, you know, that is an invitation to, to join a, a club which by definition leaves you out. And that's not a very appealing uh, invitation. The other thing the West should do is stop talking about the global South. There is no such thing as the global South. Uh, the so-called global South includes countries that are rich, countries that are poor, countries that are democratic, countries that are autocratic, and many, of course, are not even in the South. So this linguistic uh, division of the world into the global North and the global South is not only inaccurate, it is politically unwise. So aside from changing the vocabulary, what should the countries, you know, the rich countries in Western Europe and, and North America do? Well, they should put their money where their mouth is. If in fact, they want some of these big challenges addressed, uh, we need to have institutions with a much larger capital base. Um, and that includes, of course, the World Bank and the IMF. And la last but not least, uh, they also need to be much more creative, much more risk-loving, if you wish, much more aggressive in designing mixed forms of finance so that you take some capital, you mix it with some private capital, you provide guarantees, you de-risk, you leverage, uh, call it what you wish, so that real money goes to address real problems. Today, the problems are big. The money being devoted to those problems is very small, and the mismatch, of course, is making everybody very cynical, and eventually it could make the world a very troubled place. Let me stop there. And again, uh, thank you very much for the chance to participate in this conversation. Super, <clears throat> thank, thank you for, for ending on a, on a uh, set of, of controversial and, and well thought through uh, uh, ideas and, uh, that we can chew over. And I, I wanted to, to uh, I mean, there's so much to draw from amongst the, the, the four of you in the discussion discussions we've had. I wondered if uh, if the panel, before we turn to the audience, had any thoughts about the underlying big idea of liberal assumptions about uh, integrating economically as a bedrock for building peace, cooperation, and peace, whether history has demonstrated to us that that underlying principle is is not all it's, all it's meant up or uh, set up to be, whether we should be questioning those assumptions or is that, or, or is history in fact demonstrating the opposite, showing that that cooperation and through integration, trade integration, economic integration is in fact the only route we have and should always be encouraged in, in whatever form it takes. I, I throw that open to anyone who wants to, to uh, uh, address that. Or, or perhaps no one wants to address that. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think, uh, Chris, that the, the idea of liberal um, integration, creating a path to peace, kind of conflates two different things. So one is, um, it's interesting to me, Rana can tell us, that the, the, the Chinese word for globalization probably translates better to interdependence. And I think it's different to say that the world economy has a certain interdependence and that to make that interdependence work, you need a modicum, a minimum of rules and institutions so that countries can trade. To then go further and say that that trade stops them going to war, I think is wrong. And history has proved that view wrong after, you know, time after time. So I think to conflate the kind of political trajectory with the kind of economic plumbing of the world is a mistake. That would be my view. I'll, I'll, I'll add in, I agree with Nairi, um, Britain and Germany were each other's biggest trading partners before the First World War, and it didn't stop them from going to war. But I think we, we would be looking for something that is impossible, a unicorn, if we want to look for one bedrock for a stable international order. I think there have to be many and different ones, and there also have to be regional orders. But I, I think we should not underestimate the sheer 
um, virtue is the wrong word, the, the sheer importance of stability, knowing that there will be a tomorrow, knowing that countries will try and, and settle their disputes in, in a peaceful way. And I think we have seen what happens when, when stability and order break down. They are easy to destroy and, and very, very difficult to, to build again. And so I think we may have to perhaps not want to, I mean, you know, I, and I agree with, you know, the use of the word West, although increasingly it's not a geographical expression, it, it expresses shared values and a shared way of looking at the world. We may have to settle, we in the West, for less than we'd hoped for, but I think we should never lose sight of the importance of, of stability. Um, it is, I think, increasingly important. Great, thank you. We have a number of questions coming through, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll um, summarize them. One's from Anthony, an LSC alum, I quite, was asked a question about vetoes, saying that they're often discussed with the UN Security Council, but whether uh, veto power should exist for the US or, or any other state in, in the IFIs, and uh, uh, link that to the question of J Japanese and German um, GDP growth, giving them more percentage power uh, and the debate within the United States as regards to re retaining its position. So, so I wonder if, if anyone wants to reflect on, on that uh, dynamic of, of having larger margins of voting power in IFIs uh, as, as economies change, as they join, or, or as they grow and, and uh, uh, transform. I, 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 I think there's a big difference between um, proportional voting and vetoes. When you have one country that has a veto of decisions, it gives that country disproportionate power over the decisions that matter most. And that then reflects across the institution um, into um, a, um, you know, a sort of supplicating position of all other countries. So I think the, the veto power matters. I mean, it matters enough for it to be a measure of assurance to the anchor country in an institution. Whether or not you should have um, weighted voting, I think is a different question. I think weighted voting can work. You know, it gives an assurance of a different kind, um, but we need to think much more carefully about how we clump countries together in order to make their voice heard. And that to me is, um, is, is what I would do with your question about vetoes and, 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 and voting power, except that there is some variations in voting power, but um, I think vetoes have a chilling effect across the organization. Anyone else want to come in? I was just gonna say that it was interesting that um, some of the new institutions that have been set up, and I'm thinking about the um, uh, AIB and the, the new bank, also have a weighted voting uh, set of arrangements. So it seems to me that as far as the practices of uh, possible alternatives, if we can view it from that through that lens, I'm not sure that's the right lens to, 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 to view it, uh, seem to replicate many of the uh, key features in the, in the pre-existing uh, Bretton Woods uh, system. So I, I wonder if those practices are, are, you know, just what finance in our contemporary globalized world looks like in any, in any setting. And, Chris, right. I'll, I'll be happy to come, comment briefly on that. Two thoughts. Veto, naked veto, is more of a feature of the UN than it is of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, uh, in the board of those two institutions, there's the habit, there is the pretense uh, of trying to develop some kind of a consensus. Yes, it is true that if you add up the votes of country X, Y, Z, they could probably block lots of things, and sometimes maybe they do. But it is very seldom that you will see a country vetoing something at the IMF board. It's not, it's not the culture of the place. Secondly, I am not so, so, so surprised that the new banks, you know, the new, the new world banks or regional banks arising elsewhere in the planet follow the same rules because ultimately, um, and I'm going to say something which sounds like an evil economist, so I forgive me if I do, ultimately banks lend money and those doing the lending 
want to retain control. Banks where the borrowers run the show stop being banks. Um, so it is not surprising that the borrowers, um, you know, have some say, but the lenders, the ones providing the capital, uh, providing the, the, the bulk of the money, uh, retain control over the bank. And that's true at the World Bank, that's true at the IMF, and that's true at every other new bank, whether, you know, the main shareholder is China uh, or the BRICS uh, or anybody else. And again, we cannot be, you know, we may like it or not, but we cannot be surprised by that. I think we've outed you as a banker. I don't know there, but uh, mm -hmm. yes. Um, we, we have another question here from uh, Medeas Garre, uh, Research Director, Harwell Science Campus. Can we put a new structure together uh, without recreating hegemony for a particular big actor? We hear echoes of either you are with us or against us uh, from Washington. And I, I suppose it's, it's kind of re rebuilding uh, a fairer order, an order where the, the, the power distribution isn't the ultimate determinant of institutional leverage and uh, or leverage within an institution, international institution. I could say something about that. I mean, it is, I think we always have trouble confronting the nature of power and accepting that some people are more powerful than others, but we see it in our own societies domestically. We know that the big companies get away with things that as ordinary taxpayers, we don't get away with. I think we know that power is not distributed evenly, which is why we have institutions to try and rectify that. We try and use our collective power as voters, for example, in democracies to try and bring big organizations and, and big banks under control. But I think in the international order, it, it is as much a question as it is in domestic societies. And, and there are perhaps less ways of trying to control it. And you know, like empire, hegemony is a very common feature of, of, of the history of the world. Um, hegemons have played a very important part. I mean, the British Empire was the hegemonic power in the 19th century. The United States was the hegemonic power, certainly after the end of the Cold War. There is always a question, and that is how much does a great power want to pay the price of being a hegemonic power? because it can be very expensive, it can be very wearing, you have to often send your young people off to be killed abroad. And so I'd, I'd love to hear Rana um, on what prospects he sees for China wanting to be a hegemonic power, um, perhaps in its own neighborhood, but does it want to be a hegemonic power globally? Perhaps I could come right in there, because actually um, the first thought that was provoked by Margaret's very thoughtful comment there was that in China today, there is a growing school of international relations, by no means dominant, but nonetheless pretty prominent, um, which uh, draws on pre-modern philosophy, broadly Confucian in, in origin, to argue that something uh, which is at least nominally true about uh, the liberal international order, that states have equal standing within it, is actually a fiction that should not be maintained, encouraged, or uh, really be taken seriously. In that particular view, I mean, what uh, you know, many things about Confucian thinking are frankly very similar to similar ethical systems anywhere else in the world. The idea of you know reciprocal, doing reciprocal good, that sort of thing. You get it in Christianity, you get it in Confucian. It's not unusual. The stress on hierarchy as a good in its own right is something that is quite distinctive Confucianism, particularly in the context of modernity, where at least a nominal attachment to a flatness of society and equality has been a long-standing uh, tradition or uh, uh, premise for a very long time. And this school of thought that actually says, look, the United States and China are bigger countries and Myanmar and you know, uh, 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 Paraguay are smaller countries. This doesn't mean in this viewpoint, at least according to these theorists, that China or the US are therefore allowed to kick people around and do what they want. This is not a version of the Thucydides argument um, or the argument expressed in Thucydides that uh, the strong do what they, they like and the weak must suffer what they must. Instead, there is supposed to be a very strong ethical underpinning to this view of international society, but it is not an ethical view that regards equality of standing as an important part of it. And this was expressed 
frankly, rather brusquely and probably not in a very benevolent manner, but quite helpfully by the then Foreign Minister of China, Yang Jiechi, at the ASEAN meeting in 2010 in Hanoi, where after hearing all the small Southeast Asian countries, you know, asking for this and that and demanding the other, uh, he just burst out, look, the thing is that China is a big country and you are all small countries. And that's the way it is. Uh, and while it was perhaps a little overly frank, it did express that viewpoint rather, uh, rather strongly in that sense. In answer to Margaret's second question about does China want to be a hegemon, when it comes to Bretton Woods institutions, absolutely not, not at the moment. There is no desire, I think, on China's part to essentially take the United States place as the, the central point of last resort in terms of underpinning the stability of the international financial system. China does much better in terms of doing what it does now, which which is being a willing participant, sometimes a helpful one, sometimes less so, in the international system while not being the ultimate uh, point of responsibility for it, while also setting up parallel institutions, which are not necessarily in opposition to um, those, uh, those existing uh, institutions. The, the, well, the Belt and Road isn't really an institution, it's more of a, a kind of framework and a rather, rather vague one, but also boutique institutions such as the Asia International um, uh, Infrastructure Bank, which actually isn't that large as international development banks go, but it's more of a gesture that China can do this when it when it wants to. That's, I think, where China is happy being at the moment. Uh, China is doing pretty darn well in many aspects of being able to both be a cooperative member of the existing international system and to find places where it has enough resources and friends, perhaps too strong, but at least kind of willing partners to uh, institute other areas where it can exercise power in new and parallel institutions in a way that for the most part, Russia is not able to, uh, to do. And I think China itself sees itself as being rather different from Russia in that uh, respect. So really, I think Margaret, China probably thinks it's, um, it's doing fine at the moment on that front. Can I, can I jump in? Because um, I think the problem with the purely hierarchical view of power is that power blinds the powerful. And, and that that's what we should think about, that you can have, massive military power, you can have massive um, ca capacity, and yet, as Russia has found in Ukraine, you can't instantly prevail. It's a lesson the United States has learned over and over again in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, etc. And that that's the reason why Robert McNamara in, re in, his, in retrospect about Vietnam said, the reason why the United States should always consult its multilateral allies is not for their good, but for America's good, because only then can America test its own presumptions about what it thinks is good for itself and good for other countries. And I think that message is a very important one for all countries at this moment. Thanks very much. Let's, let's um, take, I think, what will be the last question. <clears throat> from Janice Huffman. Uh, what do you each think of the long-term impact, the, the, think that the long, of the long-term, that the long-term impact will be of the extreme sanctions imposed by the U.S. on Russia, Iran, <clears throat> North Korea, Venezuela, uh, on the global financial system? Do you believe the dollar has been weaponized? In what degree do you believe countries move to sanction-proof their central banks will alter dollar hegemony over the next few decades? Maybe I can uh, ask uh, Andreas first, as I think sure. he has to. I'll be happy. I'll be happy to jump in on that. Um, I don't think there's any chance in the next decade or so that people will say, "Oh, the RMB is now the reserve of choice. I am going to save in uh, something other than the dollar," uh, for one very simple reason: because the Chinese currency is nowhere as liquid or convertible or reliable um, as are the euro or the dollar and particularly the dollar. When the euro arrived uh, quite a while ago now, there were many predictions uh, that the euro would displace the dollar and it didn't happen even though the euro is issued by uh, a set of countries which are not only democratic but also institutionally strong and transparent. China is not there, uh, in fact, even though China has been gradually opening up and liberalizing its capital markets and its currency markets. Uh, and you know, given the recent tremors, China has taken a few steps back. And therefore, you know, the big wealth holders, whether it be 
the central bank of country X or the sovereign wealth fund of country Y, yeah, they might have 10% of their holdings in Chinese currency. They're not going to have 80%. Uh, yes, you see a little bit of trade in East Asia being denominated in RMB, but you're not going to see Brazil trading with the US and uh, or Brazil trade, you know, selling wheat to, to uh, uh, Germany and uh, having that transaction denominated in anything but US dollars or euros. Uh, it's simply, you know, it could happen 30 years from now. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and therefore, the sanctions, yes, will cause a few countries to think twice. Yes, uh, the issue, uh, the issue of, uh, you know, how much you have in reserves and where you keep those reserves will be in the in the mind of many central bankers and many ministers of finance. But um, is it the end of dollar hege hegemony? I think the answer is no. One thought which occurred as I was listening to Rana earlier uh, in response to Margaret's question about you know, what, where does China want to be? What, what, what financial role does it want to play? Uh, I completely agree with the way you, you described it, Rana, uh, and you described the, the, the advantages that China draws from the current set of arrangements. I would add one you, you did not mention. Um, China is the only major lender in the world today that gets away with lending and not telling anyone that it is doing it. Um, you know, I hail from South America. China has become a major lender to Argentina, a major lender to Venezuela, a major lender to Nicaragua. I would be very, very happy to know how much, in what terms, with what interest rate, nobody has any idea. Most people in Argentina and Venezuela, most bankers, even central bankers in Argentina and Venezuela have no clue. Um, and this is really quite extraordinary. Uh, 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 and dare I say, quite unacceptable. Because uh, if China is going to become a major financial player in the world, and in some senses it already is, um, you know, it is perfectly uh, 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 entitled to run its domestic affairs at its wish, as it wishes. It can keep the you know, uh, capital account in China closed. It can regulate banks at home in any way it so desires. That's fine. But if you're going to be engaging in international lending, there are international standards, there are reporting standards, there are disclosure standards. China enforces and adheres to none of these. And this is very bad news for the world. I think it's also very bad news for China. If I could work our way back through uh, the group, so to Rana, then to Naira, and finally to Margaret, and then we'll wrap it up from there. Rana. Uh, yeah, no, I, I certainly don't want to detain people for, for, for very long. Just to say thanks very much for you know excellent comments. I you know entirely again agree with uh, what Andres had to say just um, uh, just now. I think the one thing I'd say is that by the way, I, I'm not in any way endorsing the um, Confucian hierarchical view of international relations. Just pointing out that it's a subject of genuine intellectual inquiry in Beijing these days. And once again, stress the. I, I think the last thing I'd throw in is that. I do think COVID in the current situation has been something of a spanner in the works in terms of China's slow sense of an economic path that is working successfully. Uh, whether or not they can reverse the current zero COVID policy is, is one question. And how much, if at all, that does put a, a freeze or a block in terms of any aspirations to work more closely with the with the Bretton Woods institutions and their alternative versions, I think is going to be one of the most interesting questions of the next few uh, months and, and years. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Naira. Uh, yes, I think on the issue of sanctions, a vast body of evidence tells us that sanctions only have a chance of working if a very large number of countries apply them. A very large number of countries are not yet applying them and that's why you need a lot better and more diplomacy um, in order to make sanctions work. Um, so for me it just it reinforces the argument for better international dialogue and cooperation not on all issues but on the absolutely vital issues on which cooperation is necessary for you know a minimum of cooperation is necessary in order to solve the problem. And I would just add that um, I agree with Nairi that we need more and better diplomacy, which I think has been too much undervalued. I think heads of state love going to foreign meetings, partly because they can forget their domestic problems 
Um, but I do think we need that sustained interaction and sustained knowledge of each other. I'm, I'm, I'm very much reflecting on the remark that, sorry, my lights keep going out, the remark that Robert McNamara made about simply not knowing and, and becoming too confident in your own power. I mean, it's always a danger. I mean, we see it with individuals. I think one of the problems Putin had is he's only been surrounded by people who tell him everything he wants to hear. And I think it happens to great powers as well. Thankfully, here at Ideas, I don't, I'm surrounded by people who don't uh, tell me everything I want to hear. Um, and uh, it's really a, a, a pleasure to have uh, had all of you here to, to speak uh, to, to this question of the role of history and Bretton Woods institutions and your, your perspectives. And, I, and I'm very grateful for you for taking part of your day uh, for the Zoom event. So uh, again, if I could, uh, I would give you a virtual hand clap and the like uh, to thank you, to thank Professor McMillan, Professor Woods, Professor Mitter and Professor Valesco for their time and, and uh, joining us here at the Global Economic Governance Commission. We have um, another event coming up. Uh, let me just grab the, uh, I don't have the sheet with me that would tell it. It's, um, it's uh, uh, we'll, we'll be circulating this soon. Uh, uh, about um, global trade and, and changes to the global trade uh, system uh, underway. So thank you very much and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, bye.